there was a survey taken in 2007 of thousands of churches across, I'm sorry, thousands of Christians across America from a variety of kinds of churches, rural, urban, large, small. And among other things in that survey, they asked and determined what was most important to people from their, or in their local churches. In other words, when people chose a church, when they go to a church, what's most important to them about the benefits of the local church? There are a lot of things that showed up. I want to give you the top four answers that came out of that survey. Number four, the church helps me to apply the Bible to my life. Number three, the church helps me to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, the church helps me to go deeper, to understand the Bible in greater depth. And number one, the most important aspect of the local church that came out of that survey was that the church challenges me to grow and take the next steps. That was the number one answer from people across America. Implicitly, we do not want our Christian walk to be vanilla. We don't want to be stuck in ruts, either stalled in our walk with Jesus or dissatisfied with it. And so we want the church to help us grow in Christ. Help us to get there. Help us to be it. Help us to do it. And so I happen to buy into the results of that survey. I happen to agree that the church should challenge us to grow and take the next steps. It's really part of our relationship together. And so today I want the word to be profitable for me, and I want the word to be profitable for you. I want to be challenged to grow and take the next step, and I want you to be challenged to grow and take the next step. Now, I've provided, I think most of you have it, I provided a, a sheet with some blanks in it for the sermon this morning. I will let you know when it's time to fill something in, so you don't have to study this and worry and try to do that. Just go with me and I'll say, put some words in there, and you'll understand that when you get there. Um, I've titled the lesson today, uh, The Power of God Better Than a Slogan. And to get us warmed up, I am going to challenge the young people. <laughs> I'm going to have all of us uh, finish some slogans that I start. Maybe they haven't heard them all. I think most of us with gray hair will have heard all of these. Uh, but here we go. You say it out loud, the last part of the slogan, okay? Melts in your mouth. Okay, here we go, here we go. Like a good neighbor. rice a Don't leave home. Okay. Sometimes you feel like a nut. You're in good hands with. Yeah, there's always room for. That's been an interesting one. There's always room for jello. Every time, I thought that was going to be slam dunk. And every time, there's a little bit of challenge. There's always room for jello. Okay, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. All right, uh, bet you can't eat. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. I'm stuck on Band-Aid brand because, and it takes a licking in. Okay, so the world is full of slogans. Whether they're, True or not, some are creative, they are uh, kind of catchy, some are misleading, others are just wrong, possibly downright evil, some of the things that we have going on in our society. Now, the sermon is not about slogans this morning and does not even propose a slogan. The reason I reference them is this, that we are inundated with a lot of stuff, a lot of information in our world. And so since we get so much, some good and some bad, our minds can have a problem kind of assimilating it and responding to it. Sometimes uh, we just get calloused to the things that come. Sometimes we're influenced improperly by the messages of the world. But today, as we read here and listen, understand, listen to and understand the Word of God, we want the Word of God to have its appropriate place in our minds and our hearts. And so what we want to do is allow it to uh, get in us, even if, and perhaps for the specific reason, of pushing other things out of our minds. Okay, we want to let the Word of God in and other things sometimes get them out. So let the message and the wisdom of the world go. Let the message and wisdom of the Word stay. So before we jump into, like, the real sermon part stuff, okay, let's pray together. 
Father in heaven, we just are again thankful for everything about you, all that you are. You are awesome. And you uh, manifest, have manifested yourself throughout history and, uh, and have shown yourself to be awesome. And we love you and appreciate you. Father, help us to grasp everything that you have for us. Help us to receive it. Help us to act upon it and to live lives that bring you great glory because that's what you desire. That's what we desire as your people. So, Father, just move us today with your word. Speak to us through what you have done and call us to your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So it was a small town somewhere in the countryside, maybe six or 700 people, about the size of the congregation that Janie and I attend uh, in Oregon. And uh, like many other villages, it was made up of people from several extended families. So there were lots of brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins who lived there. The children, they grew up together, playing in the streets and probably even learning the family trade together. Higher education was limited to the few. Now, not necessarily limited to the rich. It was to those who actually excelled. They showed this aptitude for learning, more and more greater and greater learning. But in addition to the aptitude, took that desire, that passion. So it was really only those with both the aptitude and the passion that moved forward into the highest levels of education. Uh, they, they were chosen, kind of selected in that final cut in their later teens. And, and uh, they needed to just sort of uh, express not only all that interest in learning, but ultimately in greater teaching. So that was, that was what they did. The rest of them fundamentally went to something like trade school. It's not that they were bad. It's just that their calling was not to be in higher education. They were not to be the scholars or professors of their culture. They weren't to be the go-to guys with the answers for everybody's questions. If, uh, if a reporter came to town, these wouldn't be the guys that they would look up to interview. Uh, if a news reporter was there, yeah, they didn't interview them, and they were, they were really probably the backbone of the economy. If they went away, things might grind to a halt. You could call them possibly uh, blue-collar workers, maybe even common labor. Uh, They probably had similar interests to others in their community. A common heritage, common religion, common events. They had lots in common. And as years went on, they became good at their trade, skilled, efficient. And even though it was hard work, they probably became comfortable Comfortable until, comfortable until it happened. It seems that three of them had a life-changing encounter. They were each offered an opportunity to step into the world, to make a difference in the world. And that opportunity was such that they didn't even return to live where they grew up. It included risk, purpose, and destiny. And so theirs was not a few minutes of fame with TV cameras and paparazzi like mesmerized so many in our culture today. But this was the moment of decision for a lifetime. Because you see, this particular town was near the water. And so the common trade was fishing. It's what people did when they lived near the water. And so three common hardworking young men who had for some reason not passed the muster... They had not really measured up to the standard to become disciples of a rabbi. Three young men named Peter, Andrew, and Philip from the little town of Bethsaida, which means house of fishing, met Jesus and became disciples of the rabbi. These fishermen met the master fisherman who called them to be fishers of men. And they were invited into a whole new level of education, different than what the others were getting. Now, it's possible that James and John were from the same village, but either way, the story is the same. Fishermen passed over for college were picked 
by the master. And so it sets the stage for what we want to discuss today. And if you don't remember anything else, remember this. That God uses common people, even from small villages, to do great things in the world. And so here's your first place in the outline. It's really just notes. It's not exactly an outline, although I call it that. Fill these in. God will use us, you and me, to do great things. God will use us you and me, to do great things. So over the years, God has called his people to do a lot of things in a lot of places. But what he really does now is he calls, us, he calls us today to do what is best for his kingdom today and in the future, not to live in the past. Don't, don't worry so much about what we did before. But what is it that God wants us to do today, now? And how does that affect the future? Uh, Put this in your outline. Too often, we believe that we are waiting on God to learn or hear his call, when in reality, he is waiting on us. Too often, we believe that we are waiting on God to hear his call, when in reality, he is waiting on us. You see, his call is not a secret. People change, culture changes, technology changes, but God does not change And his call does not change. Seek and save the lost. Be fishers of men. Make disciples. Pursue mercy, justice, and faithfulness. Hunger and thirst for the very righteousness of God. You see, we really do know his call. We understand it. We've heard it. But we need to consider getting on doing it. So as we do that, as we consider being his disciples... And how the power of God is to work within us to accomplish his will. I'd like for us to spend some time in Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 3. Um, I suppose if we have a text for this morning, it was what was read there at the end of chapter 3. Paul writes this book to discuss the eternal purpose of Christians and the church. What is it that God wants of the church and his people? And so listen again to what he says at the end of chapter 3. Now to him who is able. You don't have to put that up. I'm not quoting from that version. (laughs) It'll confuse everybody. (laughs) Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now, Paul, he did, he wanted the church to fulfill its purpose, to fulfill its part in the eternal purpose of God. And he says in chapter 3, verse 10, that that is to make known the manifold wisdom of God. That's the purpose. And then he goes on in that chapter. I'm just going to kind of summarize, paraphrase paraphrase, in verses 14 through 19. It says that Paul gets on his knees. I referenced that in Bible class. He gets on his knees and he asks that they be strengthened with power by the spirit who lives in them. And that they comprehend the vastness or magnificence of God. That's what Paul prays for. You see, we need the power of the Spirit at work in us, and we need to comprehend, to the degree we can, the very magnificence and vastness of God in order for Him to work through us the way He desires. Now, we see God as big in here, right? Magnificent, huge God. Because we all pretty much agree. We're all on the same side, so we can praise Him and we can magnify Him because we see Him big inside of these walls. But too often, we see God as small out there. You see, because outside these walls, there's opposition. There's opposition to what we believe, and there's opposition to God himself. And so, if we're going to allow God to work through us in the future, it's going to depend upon us seeing and comprehending how magnificent, how vast God is, how powerful he is, even outside of these walls. So, let's consider a little further Verses 20 and 21. Now to him. 
You see, when we get on our knees, and we need to get on our knees, we need to be clear about the one that we are addressing. Now to him, this is the one, the father from whom every family on earth derives its name. The maker of heaven and earth, the giver of life, the one who's made everything that is, who raised people from the dead, the one who Paul says is able. Now to him who is able. You see, from the foundation of the world, God has been showing his magnificent power. And we need to, we need to recognize that the God that we pray to, the God who we serve, the God who is our maker, is all-powerful, and he is able. And the question is, able to do what? He's able to do what? He's able to do exceeding abundantly. Exceeding abundantly what? He's able to do exceeding abundantly beyond. Beyond what? Beyond all. (laughs) Beyond all what? Beyond all that we, all that you and I, can even ask or think. Can we get our brains wrapped around that? That God is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. You know what we need to do? We need to have an ask and think contest. I mean, it's okay to have ice cream socials. It's okay to go out to pizza. It's okay to do some things. Okay, it is. It really is. But we need to have ourselves an ask and think contest. Because we need to ask and think way bigger than we have ever done before. Because, you see, whatever is in our minds is actually smaller than what God is able to do. It is smaller than what he calls us to do. And frankly, it is smaller than what he'll actually do through us. And so God calls us to ask and think big. To ask and think way, way, way bigger than anything that we can do in and of ourselves. And that, that is the key. It is the key to... God's call and how he will work through you and me, work through us personally to accomplish his will now and in the future. We must ask and we must think or imagine because God will then do exceeding abundantly beyond that so that he gets the credit. Okay, That's how it works. Now, If you have heard of the Moravian prayer vigil, raise your hand. I want to know the audience and who's heard about this. Moravian prayer vigil. Okay. That means, well, yeah, okay, all right. You've heard about it, but you don't know what I'm going to say about it. Okay. So you're all all free game to answer if I have a question for you, right? It was April 27, 1727. This is in Germany. That 24 men and 24 women entered into covenant with each other to pray one hour each day of scheduled prayer. They were from a community, a faith community of about 300 people. So in between, in between the size of your congregation and our congregation. Now, as they got started, people joined them in the commitment. I do not know how many people ultimately made this covenant. But they decided that they were going to pray in groups of three people for one hour in the designated place of prayer and then be relieved by somebody else and then be relieved by somebody else and be relieved by somebody else. So it's an unbroken prayer vigil. Do you have the, you have the picture here? Okay. Have you ever been engaged in one somewhere? How'd it go? How long did it last? The, the 24 hours. 24 hour prayer vigil. So you had a group of people, either 24 people or more taking turns and, and praying. Okay. So we've been engaged in those kind of things not a lot. I didn't hear very many responses, but we've engaged, been engaged. All right. So you see, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have uh, telephones. They didn't have ways to remind each other. They all gathered in their groups of three and, 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 and did this. I'm going to have you fill in the blanks here. But before we do that, how long would be a pretty long prayer vigil? How long would you commit? To? How long would be a pretty long prayer vigil? A month? I, that, would that be pretty serious? Wouldn't it? Could you pray and never have a broken time somebody praying here for, for a month? That would be pretty serious, right? 
So this, this Moravian church, they prayed, well, you can fill in your blanks, right? Somewhere here. 168 one-hour time slots each week, okay, for 110 years. Let that soak in. In 15 years, they had sent out 70 missionaries. In their 110 years, they had sent out hundreds and hundreds of missionaries throughout the whole world. They impacted, they impacted the whole world out of that church. So it was from 1727 to 1837. Okay? Is that serious? That's pretty serious, okay? So, get back to my notes somewhere. Excuse me. The reason they did that is six months after they started their, their vigil, they undertook a massive evangelistic mission. They had threats of death, poverty, plague, all kinds of stuff, and it did not deter them. They stuck with it through everything and impacted the whole world. Seems amazing to us, but do we really wonder how that works? Do we really wonder what is the key to God's call in our future? It's to commit to regular, devoted, faithful prayer about God at work in us. We're called to dream big and ask. Have you been doing that? You see, it's not a slogan. It's not an idle call. It's a real call to dream big and ask. Get on our knees and ask God to work mightily through us individually and as his people to accomplish his very will and purpose. Have we been doing that? To his glory. Not to ours, not to yours but your prayers, your dreams for his purpose. You see, if we ask little and think little, in our midst, God is going to do little. But if we get on with asking and thinking big, he will do big according to the power that works within us, our passage today. But what power is that? What power is it that works in us? Ephesians 1 Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. You see, too often we can go around as Christians with unenlightened hearts. Not recognizing what it is that God has for us, what he provides to us. It was a first century church problem. And we are subject to that same issue today. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. And that's what I'm talking about, okay? His power with surpassing greatness. You see, if we do not know, if we do not comprehend the magnificence of of God, the vastness of his presence, and the greatness of his power, then we will be restricting him in our lives. And so I've got a question. If you're driving a car down the road and you want to go faster, what do you do? Step on the gas. It is a very fair answer. I think we probably are all thinking that and all do that. But sometimes what is needed is for us to get off the brake. You see, moving forward has to do with calling on the power available, but also not artificially restricting or inhibiting it. God wants to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. And if we put on the brakes, if we put up the barriers, if we think that he is not able, that we are not able with his power at work in us, then we are going to have clear self fulfilled prophecy he's not going to work in us Um, here's for your outline if we put the brakes on God due to our fear 
of going too fast, then we restrict God. If we put the brakes on God due to our fear of going too fast, then we restrict God. And so I've kind of already said this. I'll I'll make the point again that if we don't believe he'll do that, if we don't get on our knees and ask, if we don't participate in this, it will be a self-fulfilled prophecy. He does not going to do it because this is part of the process of engaging the power of God in our lives. Back to verse 19. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. These, the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, the surpassing greatness of his power. They're all in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. His might. What might is that? It's the might, verse 20 says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but the age to come. So, we've got to get this, that God has been manifesting his power forever. And the single greatest manifestation of the power of God is the resurrection of Jesus. Single greatest. I mean... We have eyewitness testimony of it. Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by it. We do not want to be removed from, we cannot be, we really don't want to be, from the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if our faith and our actions are not rooted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the reality of that, then we need to be transplanted into a different pot. If we don't recognize that God's power is real and this really happened, we've got to be shifting where we're rooted. But the text goes on in verse 22. He put all things in subjection under his feet and, put this in your outline, he gave him as head over all things to the church. He gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, many people, and possibly many of us, have been missing this for years, for decades. You see, because a lot of people go to this verse to say that Jesus is the head of the church. That's a very fine truth. It's just not this verse. This verse says that Jesus is head over everything, everything that exists to the church, or for the church. That's what this verse declares. And so the hope, riches, and power of God, which he brought about when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, are active, such that Jesus today is head over everything for us to be able to accomplish his will, that he will be able to work through us to do that. The power of God throughout history is notable. I mean, if there's anything we can note about God, it's that through history, he has done mighty things to accomplish his will. And also, that his love and mercy are even manifested by his power. Recognize the resurrection itself, okay? That, That God acts powerfully in our world. Sometimes he works his power himself, Sometimes he works through others. These are going to be familiar to you. He created the world out of nothing. Gave Abraham and Sarah a child in old age. Put Joseph in power in Egypt. Parted the Red Sea. Sent manna from above. Parted the Jordan River. Caused the walls of Jericho to be crumbled. Spoke through a donkey. Consumed water-soaked sacrifices with fire. He delivered men from a fiery furnace. He sent Jesus, born of a virgin, who healed the blind. He fed thousands with a handful of loaves and fishes. He raised the dead. The list goes on and on and on. And there is no question that God is powerful, nor that he performed great, magnificent things, feats, throughout history to accomplish his will. We cannot deny that. And here is for your outline. There is no question that he intends to have his power at work in us. There is no question 
that he intends to have his power at work in us. Do we believe that? Do we think about it, dream about it, and ask? Do we ask him to work through us? How will he work? What will he do? He healed a paralytic to show that he had the power to forgive sins. Because the mighty power of God is for drawing people to him, to the Christ and saving them. God's power at work in us today is for the same purpose. To be salt and light. To make known the manifold wisdom of God. To save souls and make disciples. And I want you to hear this out of John 14, 12. Jesus said that those who believe in him shall do greater works than he did. Okay? Those who believe in him shall do greater works than he did. Now I want to propose that raising people from the dead, which the apostles did, is not greater than Jesus raising Lazarus after four days. Point is that miracles were not then and are not now the greater works to which he refers. The greater works that believers are to do is to live and share the good news of Jesus such that other people are called to him and obey him and get on with doing the same thing. That is greater work and that brings glory to God. And don't forget, Jesus chose the leftovers, the commoners, those who had not made it in the traditional world of religious education. They were uneducated Galileans and everybody knew it. Yet God chose them to work through them to do works that were greater than the very works that he did. And so how does God work through people? There was a day when it was Moses performing miracles with a staff. Samson slaying or killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. David slaying Goliath with a sling and a smooth stone. There was a day when it was God performing miracles through the man Jesus. There was a day when it was the apostles testifying that they had seen the resurrected Christ. And today we live in a day when he does greater things than all of that. His gospel brings spread to the whole world through all of us who believe. The leftovers of today. People from small villages or big cities. Educated or uneducated. The point is this. God planned all along to do greater things than Jesus did through his power at work in his disciples of his day and in his power at work in us today. That's what God has planned. Just out of Ephesians alone, a few things. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. The manifold wisdom of God is to be made known through the church. We are to be fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. We are to perform uh, with our own hands what is good in order that we may have something to share with those who are in need. God has chosen to work through us. His power is at work in us. And Jesus is head over all things that exist for us to be able to accomplish his will, his purpose in this world, and to bring him glory. So think about it. Think about the real battle that we face, the real struggle and how God works in us. Chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm. 
power of God in our lives will work mightily in truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit. We need to suit up. You see, the opportunity that we are offered is to make a difference in the world. We are offered an opportunity to step into the world. Never see discipleship. Never see your Christian walk as stepping into a church building. We need to gather together. There's a reason for that. But never see your walk as stepping into a church building. See it as stepping into Christ Jesus. Clothing yourselves with Christ. And then stepping into the world to make a difference with his great power at work in us. In you and me personally, individually, to do great things. So what's the application of all this? Common people, chosen by the master with his spirit living in us. We need to do this, actually do this. We need to read his word looking looking for what he wants us to do. So often we're reading it because we have an assignment, you're supposed to read it, it's time to read it, or whatever. We need to read it looking for what he calls us to do. I've been working with some young men. We went through uh, the whole New Testament together, reading it, looking for what God is calling us to do. And their whole lives are changed because they're actually responding to what God is calling them to do instead of just reading the book. Number two, after we see what God wants, we need to get on our knees and ask. We need to ask him to do mighty things through us to fulfill that purpose and that will. Now, I'll tell you, read through it another time, looking for the prayers that are in the New Testament. What is it that people are praying about? Like Paul getting on his knees in Ephesians 3, what he asked. Look for what it is that people are appealing for God to do. And then the third thing is, we need to let him work through us to do that. We need to get on with the very things that God has for us to do. What are those things? You're going to find them in the book. Do you think it's going to be visiting orphans and widows? Do you think it's going to be being salt and light? Pursuing mercy, justice, and faithfulness? How about making disciples of all people? I think you'll find it in the book. I think God calls us to do this, and he will empower us to do that great work. Now, to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing a song. Clearly, the the response is a couple things. If you have not headed down that path, you want to head down that path and find, and allow, find God, allow him to work at you, you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you have obeyed, But I want to tell you, if you haven't been going down the path of being a disciple and making disciples, we need to encourage one another to do that. We need to step into that process and watch God move in our midst to do great things beyond what we have even been thinking. So if you have any need at all, please come while we stand and sing.